You are watching the Fatu Network Live. This is News Review, and I am Lamin Jai. Coming up. Today marks four years since a group of Gambians living in America and Europe launched an attack on State House. Jaka CCJT takes us through the ill fated event. I will also be speaking to Gambian American Aisha Mbo, who works as a presenter and reporter for a fo local Fox channel in the U.S. state of Connecticut. These and more coming up. I'll also be speaking with, uh, to uh, Banka Mane, who was uh, one of the people behind uh, the December 38th coup, at, at least at uh, the, the initial stages of that uh, episode, coup episode there. But first, we will do a review of the newspapers. I have um, the standard. I also have uh, the point today. So we'll quickly go through the, the standard. Uh, first, the lead story is saying APRC must never be permitted to protest for Jame's return. Um, also, NAM says SRC leadership brawl can set Gambia on fire. Barrow's choice for ombudsman uh, rejected. Also, VP Sparks outrage in failed bid to pass ombudsman's nomination. My decries, decries mis mismanagement of public funds. Let's quickly go through their story. So the chairperson of the Gambia Center for Victims of Human Rights Violations has said the APRC must not be given permit to protest to demand for President or former President Yaya Jame to return. Gambia would be, that would be a total disregard and lack of sensitivity to the plight of victims. If the government should give the APRC such a permit to demonstrate, it is going to be an insult and slap on the faces of the victims, given all the revelations about the former regime's human rights violations, Sheriff Kijera told the Standard in an exclusive interview there. NAM says SIC leadership brawl can set Gambia on fire. The National Assembly member for Kiang Central, Bakari Kamar, has said the ongoing dispute over the leadership of Supreme Islamic Council can set the country on fire. He was speaking during the adjournment debate there at the National Assembly in Banjo last week. Also, Barrow's choice for ombudsman rejected. In a historic decision last week, National Assembly members vetted, vetted and rejected Babukar Suarez's nomination as ombudsman of the Gambia. Suarez was nominated by President Adama Barrow in consultation with the Public Service Commission. This nomination was put before lawmakers on 18 December. December 2 then passed it to, to their public appointment committee for scrutiny. The committee, which is chaired by Sambajala, concluded that Suarez doesn't meet the requirements for the job. VP Sparks outreach in failed bid to pass on Boothman's nomination. Vice President Dr. Aisatu Ture has, has to be called to order when she went about passionately defending the nomination of Buwakar Suarez as ombudsman. Uh, that also happened during the adjournment debate there, there last week. During also, my decries mismanagement in public sector. The leader of the Gambia Moral Congress has said that no one should ex accept the lame excuse that Gambia lacks money to develop key sectors such as agriculture, health, and education. There is money here. The problem is mismanagement and misallocation in the public sector. My party told delegates at the third national congress of the GMC held in Nyakoi Medina Saturday. And now uh, let's look at what the point is reporting on today. A new Supreme Council executive formed. Deputies reject Barrow's pick for ombudsman, same as the standard. Honorable Jada disagrees with minority leader, foreign affairs minister, bids farewell to outgoing German deputy head of mission. So, um, point is also reported on the Su Supreme Islamic Council Bruhaha there. The Maju Majmu Atul Raudatul Majalis on 22nd December 2019 formed a new executive to lead the Supreme This development came barely months after they urged the country's Supreme Islamic Council to call a Congress for election of a new executive. Deputies reject Barrow's pick for ombudsman, same as the standard there. Sidia Jada, National Assembly member for Willy West, has said that legal mindedness is not a requirement to be an ombudsman, stating the person needs substantial administrative or professional experience, but not the legal experience as indicated by minority leader Samba Jalo. Honorable Jalo said that Babuka is Suare, President Adam Barrow's nominee, lacks the legal judgment or investigative skills to be appointed the ombudsman. However, the Honorable, Honorable Jadas, who was speaking during an extraordinary session on the appointment of the ombudsman on Friday at the National Assembly Chamber, said the 
president has not put the cart before the horse, arguing that section 164 of the constitution mandates the president to appoint an ombudsman in consultation with the Public Service Commission, subject to confirmation by the National Assembly, which he has done. So um, that will be all for the papers. We will now go through um, some of the stories we have for you today. So it was supposed to be a moment that would finally see former President Yair Jame yanked out of power, the moment that would finally afford Gambians a new start, and the moment that the Gambia would look to the future with optimism. The December 30, 2014 coup was one that its plotters thought was going to save the Gambia from the Jame dictatorship. The coup, however, misfired, and three of the coupists were killed by State House soldiers loyal to then President Yaya Jame. Jagasi Jede prepared this report as the country marks four years since the incident. The plot to overthrow Yahya Jame four years ago is one that continues to retain huge Hollywood importance. Only that this was not a Hollywood movie. It was a real event that involved former soldiers slipping back into military gear and venturing into what would become the most dangerous military enterprise ever. On 30 December 2014, a group of dissident Gambians, most of them with military persuasion, launched an early morning attack on the State House while President Yahya Jame was out of the country. The attack was quickly repelled. Three died, four escaped, and one was arrested. The next day, the government issued a statement. Good evening, fellow Gambians and members of the international community. On Tuesday, 30 December 2014, at 2 a.m. GMT, the State House was attacked by a well-equipped, well-funded group of Gambian terrorists living in the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Senegal, with support from their collaborators abroad with sophisticated automatic machine guns and assault rifles. Five of these attackers launched their assault from the main gate of the State House by the Albert Market, while the three others attempted to enter through the rear gate by Marina Parade. The leader of the attackers was Lamin Sane, codenamed Jibia, a former Lieutenant Colonel of the Gambia Armed Forces and former commander of the State Guards Battalion, who was dismissed from the Gambia Armed Forces and fled to Senegal and later to the United States. Lamin Sane was the ringleader of the coup. The 36-year-old was a former commander of State Guard. He had fled to the United States in 2013 after he fell out with Jame. He then returned two years later on a mission that was not only meant to settle personal scores but also to save a country that has been held hostage by a brutal dictatorship. He was among the three people who were killed. The coup took place while President Jame was out of the country. He was reportedly in Dubai, and when he returned, he invited GRTS and Daily Observer to State House. Your Excellency, welcome home. Your Excellency, there have been reports that there was a coup attempt in the country here. Now you are back. What is your statement? <laughs> Contrary to what the, first of all, I want to thank the Gambian people for their support, always. I live for the Gambia, I die for the Gambia. I live for Africa, I die for Africa. And I will die fighting for the truth. But no human being can do anything to me, my government or the Gambia. The Gambia is a blessed country. We have the Almighty Allah on our side and nobody can do anything about it. Well, it was not a coup. It's a lie that it was a coup. It was attacked by dissidents based in the U.S., Germany, and U.K. All, you know that all these weapons, some of these things were, uh, some of the materials are U.S. made that they have. And of course, also, we have a comprehensive plan that they have been planning. Uh, they have their uh, literature. At, this was the final stage of their plan. They have stage one, stage two, uh, that is, uh, uh, and then the final stage phase that is stage three that is, that is the attack and uh, what is interesting is the fact that uh, uh, we were able to get uh, all what they put in the uh, computer we were able to download everything we were able to break the code and uh, the information that I will release tomorrow 
is very startling. Uh, the Gambia Armed Forces are very loyal. They are, as far as we are concerned, there is any single participation of the armed forces except in nullifying the attack. So it cannot be called a military coup because I've seen in the, some media houses saying that there was a, a coup. This wasn't a coup. This was an attack by terrorist, a terrorist group backed by some powers that I will not name now. Uh, but of course we know where the dissidents are based. They always talk about that they are friends of the Gambian people. But what we have seen now, every Gambian would know that they are not friends. It was an attack and they, they had the plan, we have all the documents that we will show tomorrow, uh, that they thought that by, uh, by attacking State House and getting the State House, then the, 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 the armed forces would join them because they said, which is a big lie, that the armed forces are disgruntled and so they were just waiting for that. And if the Gambian people also uh, were disgruntled and as soon as they attack, they will take over the state house and then Gambians will flood in their thousands to join them. And that's why they have this cut of weapons. Okay? Uh, so, uh, so it cannot be called a coup because a coup has to come from a regular armed forces. Of course, these are also uh, soldier, uh, soldiers that were dismissed. Uh, one of them was the state guard commander and he thought that because he was here, uh, he, he knows everything about this place. Let me tell you one thing, no force can take over this place. No human force, unless by the Almighty Allah. And nobody can destabilize this country. Let, I swear to the Almighty Allah. So any, anybody who comes to attack this country, be ready because you're going to die. No matter who you are and who backed you, we have the Almighty Allah. It's the supreme power, nobody can do anything about it. It was not known at the time where the Jammeh government buried the bodies of Lamin Sane, Njaga Jain, and Jaja Nyas. It was in 2017 when the Barrow administration found out they were buried in a forest in Fonyi. The bodies were then exhumed as part of their investigations into the human rights violations and abuses that occurred during the 22 years rule of former President Jammeh. In January this year, the bodies were handed over to their families at a ceremony held at the Ministry of Justice in Banju. It is with profound solemnity that we are gathered here today for the handing over of the mortal remains of Mr. Lamin Sane, Mr. Alaji Jajanyas, and Mr. Njagajan to their respective families. Due to the ongoing criminal trial, the remains of Mr. Solo Sanden, which was also exhumed and identified, could not be handed over to his family today. This ceremony, which takes place in the context of our transitional justice process, serves as a demonstration of our belief in upholding human dignity and the principles of basic human decency. The fight to end the Jammeh dictatorship took different forms. The December 38th coup was one form, but the fact that this coup was planned all the way in the United States and Europe makes it a unique event in the history of Gambia. After the coup, Jammeh bragged that he would rule for one billion years, only to receive the shock of his life at the polls in December 2016. He now lives in exile in Equatorial Guinea. Jaka CCJT reporting for the Fatu Network News Review. The plot. Jaka CCJT reporting there. So this coup took place five years ago. Today marks exactly five years since um, this coup um, took place, ill-fated coup there. So now I have uh, on the line uh, Mr. Banka Mane. Banka was one of the members of uh, the, this group. Well, he was part of the, uh, the coup there. Uh, Mr. Mane, uh, thank you very much for speaking to us there. Thank you. It was my pleasure, Lamin. So, Mr. Mane, first of all, um, what do you make of today, a day like this? Five years ago, a group of Gambians, mostly uh, dissidents who lived in the U.S. and Europe, uh, planned to overthrow the uh, government of Yaya Jame, but the coup misfired, leading to the death of three of the attackers. What, to you, what does this day mean? Well, it's 
it's a very, very somber day, as you know, because we lost some very, very brave souls uh, in this incident, uh, very patriotic citizens, uh, folks that uh, I, some of whom I knew quite well, um, and uh, these individuals uh, uh, were uh, ready to do anything for the Gambia, and uh, because they felt very strongly about what was going on in that country. Um, when you think of, uh, say, uh, Ndagajan, he had it all in the United States. He didn't need to, to even be in, and he hadn't even been in the Gambia for a long time. Uh, so really, it's, America became his home. But uh, despite all that, he had his family here and all that. But despite all that, uh, what obtained in the Gambia really got to him. I had many, many conversations with Ndaga over over time about the Gambia, and he, he, he's, he just felt very, very strongly about the need for change because he just didn't like what was happening to the Gambian people. It really got to him. Lamin uh, Sane, the same thing. Um, Lamin Sane was young, a young, young kid, when you, when you, when you come to think of it. Um, Lamin Sane was born in 1979. So he was uh, basically 35 years old when he took this risk. I mean, with a young family, a beautiful wife, uh, settled in the United States already, had a good job. So he didn't have to really look back or to go and even risk anything for the Gambia. But still, he felt the need uh, to do this because he felt he owes it to that country. With his military service and uh, having worked for the country, he felt that this is his home after all and that um, in his life, I mean, basically, it wouldn't be fair for him to sit here in the United States and not go to the Gambia and do what needed to be done. And he felt very, very, very strongly about it. But the last, I didn't know him, obviously, but from what I've heard from friends and family members, it seemed as if he was just exactly, he felt in the same mold with uh, the rest of his guys. Now, you've come down to the ones who, who, have, who survived. Um, Chadron Guy. Chadron Guy is, uh, I mean, from all indications, what we know, he is a millionaire, um, a success, very successful guy in the United States. He didn't have to get himself involved in Gambian affairs at all. Uh, but still, he did. He committed his money, committed his time, put his life on the line. He could have easily uh, been killed in the Gambia. Um, Alad Bao, same thing. I mean, a professional in his own right, he was in the U.S. Army, um, you know, he, obviously by that time he had left the U.S. Army, but the opportunities abound. He could get a job anywhere, go do anything else, with his you know, uh, uh, qualifications, he could really do anything. But still, he too felt the need to uh, go ahead and risk his life and put it all on the line for, for, for the Gambia. But I found the same thing. Family, beautiful wife, just like Elijah, I mean, Elijah Barrow and uh, Chan and Guy. Same thing. Beautiful wife, beautiful family, had a job, was doing well, and uh, started to risk it all. So, I mean, when you go and look at all these individuals, and I can talk this, say the same thing about Bai Lo and Delta Bojang and all the guys, literally, who really put it all on the line. You look at them and you're like, why would they do this? Well, it's because they love the country because they cared about their nation, and because they felt the need to liberate uh, the, the, the Gambian people. I mean, what was going on in the Gambia was unacceptable. Um, and frankly, I've always said this, uh, what ECOMIC did in the Gambia totally vindicated December 30. I think what it did was it showed to everybody that this was the only avenue left uh, for uh, Yame to go, and it was the only avenue you could get rid of Yame. If ECOMIC didn't come there with their guns, um, there is no way Yame will have, Yame will still be in power. So. Um, for me, it's a day of remembrance, a very somber day, and a day of sadness, obviously, that we have lost some brave souls, but obviously a day also to reflect on the bravery and uh, the gallantry of all these men who risk it all and were part of this effort. So really, we owe a debt of gratitude to each and every one of them, and we should definitely celebrate them and uh, you know make sure that our country um, uh, has them fully placed in our history books to uh, remember them as folks who gave it all for country and are willing to give it all for country, really. So, so, so Banka, now let's quickly go through your role in this event. You have a lot of some people who say that Banka, in fact, was the fulcrum of this coup. You were the person who met with uh, Mr. Lamin Sane at the airport while he was fleeing to the United States, and then you started this whole campaign, and then some credit you for being the person who linked Lamin Sane to uh, the chief financier, of course, Mr. Cheno Njai. At some point, even at some, at, at some stage, you were kicked out of the, out, out of the group. But then um, you still, you know, supported the idea of 
a coup uh, in, in removing in removing Jame. But what happened was that the coup didn't succeed. And then, uh, you know, there were various, you know, arguments out there. There were some people, our political leaders at the time, some people, some of them said, well, this was not the way to remove Jame. It's not right to, uh, you know, stage a coup d'etat. What do you make of that as someone who, you know, was, was, was part of this? Well, uh, um, let me say that I was never kicked out uh, 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 at all. But um, my role, yes, I was the one who linked Isane and Jaga and pretty much, you know, an organizer, if you will. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, coming down to the, the point about uh, the uh, political party leaders, for instance, you said they, they condemned the coup. I, I, I could understand why they would condemn the coup. The, the parties are legally constituted organization. They were set up to pursue an electoral process, an electoral agenda, and to seek power through those kinds of means. They were not uh, meant for what happened on December 30th. Now, but then at the same time also, uh, what we must always remember uh, is, is that uh, this was an, a necessary part of the process. Anything that really, uh, when you, uh, let's put it this way, slavery was legal. Um, uh, the, 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 the killing of Jews that took place in Germany, the, the, that, that, that Hitler, uh, the, uh, the evil acts that he perpetuated on the Jews in, in Germany, was legal. Um, uh, the, 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 the brave women who tried to liberate slaves in America, for instance, uh, uh, Harriet Tubman and all those people who were doing the right thing by freeing slaves and getting them, helping them to escape, were actually breaking the law. So this is how legal and, and morality, how that they class. A lot of times, um, issues like this, when they come up, uh, when people try to rely on the law to actually um, make the case for why they are wrong or right, that's where they obviously I get, always get it wrong. Nelson yes. uh, Mandela, with, his, with all the things that he had done, uh, was actually breaking the law, literally, in South Africa. That's how he ended up in prison. But his actions were perfectly moral, as we all have come to know. So in the end, when you look at it, um, you cannot argue these issues on the basis of the law. You have to really look at it. Was it necessary? Was it needed? Was it the right thing to do? And obviously, December 30th fits, fits all those uh, 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 descriptions in every way possible. When you look at it, you know this was the right thing to do. This was what was needed. And in the end, like I said, um, the action that economic had to take uh, vindicated December 30th already because literally that's what December 30th was meant to do. They, 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 they've come to recognize what we all recognized at the time, which is that the agenda is not going to go through peaceful means. Somebody had to come there with guns drawn and tell him that, you know, you got to leave because that's the only language he, would, he understood. And, and, and uh, you, 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 is what it is. you, you mentioned that there because Lamin Sane was determined to remove Jame uh, through the barrel of the gun. But, um, you know, at that time, the, the plotters, uh, well, those who were in support of this coup, thought this was the only way that Jame could, could be removed from power, could be kicked out of power. And then, it, 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 what it turned out, two years down the line, Gambians would lay a ballot box ambush for Mr. Jame, and stunningly, uh, he, he lost. Through the, of course, the economic later interview, interview that was the only a consequence. But what happened was that he was removed from power through um, elections. So, in retrospect, if, if in retrospect, um, what could it have been done better? For example, could could it have been avoided to understand that that was not the only way a coup d'état was not the only way to uh, remove this man from power? No, but uh, then, then you, you know, there is a cause and effect for every event. Uh, you are talking about the effect and not talking about the cause. At the end of the day, let's put all of this into perspective. The elections, that victory that you are talking about, came about because of several sets of events that took place prior to the elections. Those are the events that really made the, the, made the difference. So was Sandeng's protest. When, actually, when Sola Sandeng came out, the protest that he did actually was illegal. He was breaking the law. <laughs> yes. enough. So again, uh, but he had to do that. Um, those brave men and women on that day that came out with Solo were breaking the law. Honorable so that when he came out there, he was actually breaking the law. So it, it, this was what was needed. But and those events that literally broke the law, including these matter yet, gave, I mean, uh, collectively set the stage for the electoral defeat that Jamie came to suffer. 
So you cannot talk about the elections in isolation. You, you cannot basically make it sound like everything was honky-dory and fine, and boom, elections took place and Gabi was defeated. No. You have to explain that election victory within the context of the events that pr happened prior to the elections, and actually gave rise to and set the stage for and encouraged the actions of uh, the, the masses that uh, allowed for the electoral defeat uh, of Jammeh to take place. If you take those events out of the picture completely, I bet you you would, have, you would completely see a totally different picture. So again, this is what actually happened. But then coming back to the point, we went full circle. Actually, in the Gambia, we went from elections, we, from elections, we went to protest, from protest, I mean, uh, sorry, we went for, we started with uh, elections, we went to protest in 2000, remember, those gallant students that came out and put their lives on the line, the media also played this role, they had a hydra and lost his life, uh, working, a, a, a fighting a, a good fight, um, and, and, and you can take all these steps all the way around from the media people went back to election I mean, uh, from the uh, demonstrations people went back to elections from the elections people went to the violent method from the violent method people went back to elections and then from the elections the violent method was executed again to get Gami out of power so at the end of the day you have to take all events and put them together in a collective uh, sort of pattern to really draw a conclusion that need to be drawn and that is you have a combination of factors that really put you to get out of power the key among which, obviously, and the final uh, uh, action that really pulled the plug uh, on him and really get the job done was the very action that December 30 was meant to do, which is draw guns because the man doesn't understand a peaceful language and come there and tell him you either leave or something bad happens to him. This is basically how it all went down. So, so I want to ask you one final question, even if I will take you a little back. So why, uh, in your opinion, as someone who was, uh, you know, part and parcel of this, why do you think this, um, uh, what do you think is the reason for the failure of this coup? Because a lot of theories have been advanced. They were betrayed from the inside. People were saying Lamin Sane thought that it was, good. He was, it was going to be an easy ride. All the soldiers at State Guard were loyal to him only to get there and get disappointed, to be greeted uh, with bullets. reminds me, because it's a history, it's always a repeat of what happened before. This Matadia reminds me of um, John Brown in the United States. John Brown was this, uh, you know, white guy uh, with his family, with his sons, decided to storm the armory in Virginia, I believe, uh, to, uh, to, to the federal armory in Virginia, uh, to get guns and then go and free slaves. Well, I mean, right next to the uh, armory, uh, there was a, a, a plantation, literally, where uh, slaves were working. When he went in there, broke into the, it, it, uh, he and his sons were able to break into this armory, got guns, you know, and all this stuff. And he, was, he did that with the expectation that slavery was so bad that the slaves themselves, were, the moment he got, uh, they, they, they wanted to liberate themselves. They just didn't have access to the weapons and the means to do it. So he literally, when he got in and was able to get these weapons, he came out trying to get these slaves to join him and his sons to, to uh, liberate themselves from the clutches of slavery. And guess what? The slaves basically they, they said, no, we are not going to be part of this. So in the Gambia, the, 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 this coup, in this battalion, that's what happened. People who were, the, those who were repressed, including the army folks, Simon was with the expectation that the kind of discon the, the, the discontent that he, he, he witnessed in the army when he was there, because you have to remember, he was in that army, he was the head of the presidential guard, he was in charge of the, uh, he was at the training school, trained a lot of these young soldiers. He felt, he, he knew the discontent within the army. And he believed that when this thing happened, those people were so unhappy with Dami that nobody would be sitting there telling them, hey, join this fight, let's get this done. They would easily fight, join the fight. And then obviously there were others that he was collaborating with, talking to underground, who were fully on board with the program. But when it came down to it, they didn't do their, perform their functions that they, they are supposed to and do what they are supposed to do uh, within the Gambian National Army. So in the end, those were the details from that end and also uh, his expectation as to what was going to happen uh, in the event that, you know, because the idea was, hey, if you go in and try to take Jame out, nobody is going to come to his defense because they only wanted to get themselves out of this mess so bad. But in the end, it didn't turn out to be that. 
uh, the folks that he was relying on did not come through. And the expectation that was there also that the soldiers were so sick of Germany that they were willing to join a fight like this on, on our side just never materialized. And this literally led to uh, the kind of failure that, 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 that took place. Mr. Bangamane, thank you very much for your time there, sir. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate you. Banka Mane speaking to us there. He was a member of the December 38th coup, um, uh, failed or biked coup there, speaking to uh, us there on the events marking the fifth anniversary of uh, the incident. We will be right back. For the first time in the Gambia, your favorite GSM operator, Afrosol, is the first and only GSM operator to launch a brand new technology called the eSIM. The eSIM simply means you can use your phone without a SIM card. Do you have an iPhone 11, any of the iPhone X series, a Google Pixel 3, or any new phone that supports the e-technology? Visit any Afrosol customer care center. Activate your eSIM today. With your virtual Afrosol SIM, you can use more than one number without having a physical SIM card in your phone. Enjoy this brand new technology for the first time in the Gambia, brought to you by Afrosol. eSIM, your phone without a SIM card. For more information, please call 111. Where Afrosol goes, no, no, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. Thank you very much. So, Gambians in the diaspora continue to break barriers in all fields of human life, from real estate to law to business to other fields. And today, I have Aisha Mbo. Aisha is a journalist, a Gambian American who works as a journalist. She works with Fox News there in Connecticut, and she joins me now. Aisha, no. thank you very much for no, coming you. to us today. Thank you. So Aisha, you are a journalist. We want you to quickly run us through uh, your career as a, as a reporter. We understand you work, work for Fox News. Um, massive feat there. Take us through your career. Um, well, I, walk, I work for a local Fox affiliate, Fox 61, um, which is separate from Fox News Cable. <laughs> okay. Um, but I went to journalism school, University of Maryland, for four years. Got a broadcast journalism degree. And then I got my first job right out of college at a NBC affiliate in Nebraska. I was there for about eight months, and then I moved to North Carolina, and I was there for two years as what you call an MMJ, which means you shoot, edit, write, pretty much do everything. We call it a one-woman band, so it's just you. And then after two years there, I got a job in Connecticut as a reporter. When so was yeah, that again? 2018? Um, I moved to Connecticut, yeah, 2018, March. So I'll be there in two years, um, for two years come next year, March. So, so how is it for you, like a country, very large country, mm -hmm. US competition is massive. Mm -hmm. How is it like for you working as a reporter mm -hmm. in a country such as the United States? Um, <laughs> for me, it's not that different just because that's what I grew up watching. Um, and it's local news. so. We only cover a fraction of national news. Most of the time what we cover is local, so it has to be something that's Connecticut related. Um, there's four stations, so we compete against three other stations. There's an ABC, a CBS, um, NBC, and then we're the Fox station. So um, what is it like? Every day is different. Um, everything, like you do something different every day, whether you're covering a shooting, a fire, I don't know, the mayor's in town or the governor, or politics or what have you when I walk into work I have no idea what I'm doing that day but but, but, but what it is that mm -hmm. that intrigues you the most as a journalist when you w wake up early in the morning heading for the office and then when you get to the office but in this job as a mm -hmm. journalist what is it and it was as a reporter what is it that intrigues you the most um, the people I meet um, I feel like that is why I do what I do I feel like I meet so many different people every single day. I can't even count how many people I've met because of this job. Um, and the way we put it, we meet people on their best days and on their worst days. So I might be talking to somebody because they just lost their son in a shooting. Or I might be talking to somebody because they just did something incredible. So for me, it's that person to person connection. Um, like for those, if you don't know me, I'm a very reserved person. So because I work, do the job I do, a lot of people think I talk a lot or what have you. But for me, it's all about that one-on-one -on -one connection that you have with someone when you're interviewing them, like you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like face challenges at all? Oh, do I? 
Um, yeah, yeah. Especially when you first start off um, with local news. When you first start off, you're really starting from the bottom. It's hard. It, the hours are long. You're by yourself pretty much. You do everything by yourself. Um, and then the stress level, because we have news. So, for example, the station I work at now, we have seven hours of news in the morning. Um, we're on from 4 to 11. So when I was doing morning news, I'm doing a live shot every 30 minutes. And it's stressful <laughs> because you have to know what you're talking about. Um, breaking news is a huge thing in American media. So you're always on the go, 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 go. So, oh, yeah, so my stress level is usually like that, up here throughout the end. Yeah, that's like all day. <laughs> yeah. And pressure from mm -hmm. your editors? Yeah, it's like just meeting deadlines is a very intense pressure. We turn stories every day. Like sometimes I'll turn multiple stories a day um, and there's no excuse. Like missing the deadline by 30 seconds or 30 minutes, you're, you still missed your deadline. So yeah, <laughs> your boss is not very happy if you miss your deadline. If you miss your deadline. So it's a very high pressure job, but it's very rewarding as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, what do you think um, Gamian journalists could, uh, you know, learn, Gamian reporters mm -hmm. could learn from reporters in the US? What do you think? Um, I mean, from what I can tell, just a matter of American journalists, I feel like the different, we're very, very passionate. Um, like you have to care about public information. You have to care about people's rights to knowing what's going on, um, whether it's what's going on with their schools, their government and all that stuff. Like you have to care about public information um, you have to be somebody that's very tolerable, meaning you can deal with all types of people because we do deal with all types of people. Um, like for me, I don't, I would never do this for the money. Surprise, we don't make a lot of money. So um, you have to care about what you're doing because what will happen a lot of times is people will get into the journalism field in America thinking, oh, I just want to be on TV. And they don't realize the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. It's something you genuinely have to care about a lot. So I think just, and also listening to the people that you serve, like what do people want to hear about? Like what do people care about? What will make them tune on to the news that they can't find on Twitter or Facebook? So now take us through one work mm -hmm. that you, you've done and mm -hmm. then you feel proud to say, okay, I did this job, mm -hmm. I met the deadline and boom, here's it, it was good. Um, I mean, there's like stories that I've done that have stuck out with me. Um, did you do anything on, for example, hurricane, flo floods, for yeah, example? Yes, so hurricane, we had a hurricane, Hurricane Matthew, that caused a lot of flooding, like historic flooding. Um, the entire area got evacuated. We stayed, because when there's danger, you don't leave, because you still have to do your oh, job. Course, course. Um, that definitely sticks with me. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. Just the amount of damage that was done to people's lives. Um, and coming back and not finding a home left because the water is just like water just destroys like there's no way of stopping it um so that i feel like i'm very proud of i didn't run away you know you stay you work the hours i was working 12 hour days every day for six days straight i didn't know if i was gonna get paid the overtime but at that moment what's important is getting the information out to people and making sure that people are safe um and there was another story I covered where um, this three-year-old girl went missing on that story every day, working double to get that information out there. So stories like that stick with me. Stick with you. That help people stay safe, Yeah. if that makes sense. Makes sense. Oh, <laughs> makes, <laughs> yeah. sense. makes sense. So, so now, um, um, I, I, I'll have to ask you this mm -hmm. then. This issue of, because here in the Gambia, a lot of reporters, especially the young ones, face that problem. The problem of, because it's a highly politicized country. Sometimes a reporter mm. would report on something that maybe uh, one politician would not be happy with, and then they will come after you. Do you have Oh, we that? don't care about do, that. Do you <laughs> have that? Oh my God, you should see my email, how many messages I get about people getting angry that I'm saying angry something bad about the president. No, no. It's not about that. Like, in that's the difference. I feel like the biggest difference in America, like that's my constitutional right. I have, there's freedom of press. If we, you focus on the facts. For me, as long as you are not, like the difference between a journalist and like a host and a commentator, I have a rule of ethics, unspoken rules that I have to live by, meaning it has to be factual. So I'm not gonna write a story or say that's, a story about, let's say our president Trump, that's not true. Anything that I put on the air, it's true. Now, whether you like it or not, that's not my problem. 
My job is not to make you like what the news is. My job is to just give you the facts. You do whatever you want with it. Um, and luckily, we have the freedom of not facing any consequences for reporting yes, you, facts. You, you have that. And, and thankfully yeah. for us here, too, I think we have that, even though we still have things that need to be uh, mm -hmm. taken uh, care of. So, so, so now, um, where do you see yourself? So, you know, <laughs> where do I see myself? In the, in the, in the long run, run in the, say, five years, ten years? I don't know. So right now, I, I have a contract that's coming up next year. So we work by contracts. I have a two-year contract that's coming up next year. Um, ideally, I might want to go just do full-time anchoring, because right now I do both. both. I anchor and, and I report. And report. Yeah, so I think up next, I might just find a full-time anchor job. Um, Is that what you really want? Just I anchor. love reporting. Yes. I really do, but it's exhausting. <laughs> like you, Eventually, I want to just, you know, Be Monday through Friday. And the, I mean, if newsroom. you're being real, like... Anchors make way more money too. So <laughs> some would say it is the reporters that make way no, more money. No, 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 no. People no, no, who no. report in the war zones. We for do example, more physical war work, war zone, but because with anchoring, it's a higher pressure because you're the face of that show. So you do make more money. But um, ideally, I would like to do local news for a couple more years and then maybe try the network route. Yeah, because I mean, makes, network, it, you have to have a lot of experience. So, I mean, I'm coming up on five, so we'll see how much longer it'll take. Makes sense, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, here is what the standard newspapers said about you last year. Um, they, 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 in their new introducing section, that mm -hmm. was, I think it was in November of last year, they said, when she's not reporting, you can find her exploring different restaurants and catching up on the tons of TV shows. <laughs> so, you want to tell me you love food? Oh yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Are, that's are you, actually are you from, from my from bio. Eating? Are you I from like a trying, restaurant. You say am I from a a restaurant um, to eat some food? Yes, I like to well, eat. Well, that's what this <laughs> say. I like eating at restaurants. I do. Yes. yes, that's pretty much all I do. I go to dinner a lot. Great. Do you have anything else to say? No, thank you for having me. This is this is this has been good. Do you you were telling me that you don't like to be interviewed Generally, i don't like, like i this is, i i never get nervous in front of a camera except for if i'm on this side <laughs> so like right now i'm just like oh god <laughs> it's weird i know i know yeah. okay okay so thank you thank no, you for thank coming. you thank you so that's isa um Bo. she's a, a journalist a reporter in the u.s state of connecticut speaking to us there thank you very much until next time